everyone. Welcome to the WSO2 Ident Server Fine Grain Access Control with SACMAL Training Video. In this video, we are going to learn about the usage and benefits of Fine Grain Access Control. Let's begin by understanding the difference between access control and authorization. With access control, you control or restrict a certain entity from accessing a protected resource, whereas with authorization, you grant permission to access a protected resource. If you take the example, only friends can view my photos, the protected resources are the photos. The subject that is going to access these protected resources consists of the resource owner's friends. The action that the subject is granted is viewing the protected resources. This means that only the resource owner's friends are authorized to view the protected resources. The rest of the people are restricted from accessing these resources. With mandatory access control, the administrator creates a certain access level and each user is linked with a specific access level so that a user can access all the resources that are not beyond the user's access level. With discretionary access control, the administrator has a list of users who can access a resource. Discretionary access control provides access based on the user's identity, not by permission level. In role-based access control, authorization decisions are made based on the user's user role. For more information on user roles, please watch the WSO2 IDEN server user management training video. Lastly, attribute-based access control considers user attributes, the attributes associated with the application and environmental conditions when making the authorization decisions. Hence, this form of access control is known as fine-grained access control. Extensible access control markup language that is most commonly known as SACML is an industry standard that enables fine-grained access control. So, let's learn more about SACML. SACML is a standard policy language that supports a standard way to write access control rules and evaluate access requests according to the rules defined in the policies. Being a request response language, it enables a standard mechanism of querying authorization requests and responding with the authorization decisions. It lets you form a query to ask whether the given action should be allowed or not and interprets the result. It also has standard extension points for defining new functions, data types, combining logic, and so on. The reference architecture of SACML has some standard components which an authorization system should have. The SACML policies that enforce access control are added by an administrator to the policy store via the policy administration point, which is commonly known as PAP. When a user wants to access a particular resource in a SACML implemented setup, the request first reaches the policy enforcement point, which is commonly known as PEP. The PEP then communicates this request to the policy decision point, which is commonly known as PDP. The PDP in turn evaluates the SACML request against the policies defined in the policy store. During the evaluation, if there are any missing information which cannot be derived from the SACML request, the PDP communicates with the policy information point, which is commonly known as PIP, to retrieve user attributes and other required details. PIP depends on one or more connected attribute stores to retrieve the information required by the PDP. Once the request evaluation is completed, the PDP sends a SACML response to the PEP mentioning whether or not to grant access to the resource. A typical authorization activity involves a subject, a resource, and an action. In addition to that, there could be contextual information such as time and IP address of the request. In this example, we have identified the key components that are required to construct the authorization policy. The subject is the account, the action is the access, 
The resource is the salary information and the attribute for the environmental information is the working hours. Let's learn how this is converted into a SACML policy. This entire code block is the SACML policy that implements our previous example. The policies can be modeled in numerous ways. They can be either be based on the subject, the action or attributes. As you can see, there is a target element and rule elements. The target element defines the conditions to which the policy applies. So in this example, the salary information, which is the resource, is included within the target. The rules will only get evaluated if the conditions are met. There could be multiple rules and there could be multiple conditions within a single rule. In this example, the rule include the action which are access and modify, the subject which is the accountant and the contextual information or the attributes. So these rules indicate the additional conditions that need to be verified prior to sending an authorization response. So according to this policy, the request indicating that an accountant is requesting to access or modify salary information within the given time period will only be authorized. The rest will be rejected. Now that you learn about a SACML policy, let's check out how a SACML request looks like. This is a typical SACML request sent from the application, the policy enforcement point to the policy decision point. You'll notice that this request has the resource, the subject and the action. But the attribute that indicates the time at which the authentication is applicable is missing. As time is a system information, it is not sent through the SACML request. So this shows us that it is not necessary to pass certain information through a SACML request. When the PDP receives a SACML request, it gathers the matching policy from the policy store and the attributes from the policy information point and evaluates whether this request should be authorized or not. This is a typical SACML response. In this case, the response indicates that the access request is permitted. Based on the authorization decision, the response may indicate whether it was denied, not applicable, or undetermined. If the PDP couldn't identify a relevant policy, the decision would be not applicable. The decision would be indeterminate if a system error occurs while processing the request. SACMA responses may have information in addition to this, such as an obligation statements that can be returned along with the decision to enrich the decision flow. SACMA has a standard way of processing authorization requests, defining authorization policies, and sending standard requests and responses. So, this leads to interoperability and easy integration. The components of the SACMA reference architecture are loosely coupled, so each component needs to be aware of each other's internals. So this gives the freedom to have these components from different vendors, which makes the solution vendor neutral. However, writing SACMA policies is not an easy task, and as the policies are bulky, there is a performance impact. We have now come to the end of this training video. Let's have a quick recap of what we have learned from this training. First, we got a quick introduction to access control, authorization, and the available authorization models, and SACML. Then, we learned about the SACML reference architecture. Next, we learned about the SACML policies, SACML requests, SACML responses. Finally, we learned about the pros and cons of using SACMA. If you have any questions or need further clarification, feel free to get in touch with us through the following channels. Our email is iam-dev at wso2.org in Stack Overflow tag with wso2 or wso2is and our Slack channel is wso2is.slack.com. Thank you for watching this video. Hope to meet you in another exciting training video.